Hello, everybody. Thank you, Maggie, for introducing me. Hi to all of you. Thanks for joining today. And I am so grateful that Cher has carved out the space and the time for this important conversation. Because we so often talk about the physical and the medical impact of, of menopause, but the emotional impact is also medical and an important one to discuss and to give some space and time around. Like Maggie said, I love that people are joining into that chat. Go for it, use it, find each other there, um, pop up whatever's resonating for you. If something's coming up that I'm saying and you're like, yes, 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 that's me, go ahead and write your experiences in there. If there are questions, if there are things I'm missing, add your perspective or maybe another point of view into there as well. My voice and what I have to offer you as a professional is certainly important but you're all living this and you're all walking it and you're finding each other and being able to confirm and to normalize and to share tips and tricks. That's really, truly so powerful. So um, I sometimes stop and start my slides to kind of just come in and check in with you. Feel free to unmute and to add your voice into this conversation um, or put it over in the chat. If I read anything from the chat, I will take out names. I will protect you in that, but I might say, hey, I'm noticing this over in the chat and it's really pulling my attention. So just so you know, um, let's use all of this together as we talk about this important topic. Let's get going. There's going to be two breakout sessions that Maggie said. So use those in whatever way is really meaningful to you. We've got three facilitators who are also survivors that are going to be in that space to kind of keep the wheels moving because um, nobody likes awkward silence. But, um, but we'll all kind of still again find each other here. Okay, so here we go. Menopause, the emotional impact of menopause. That's why we're here today. I know for some of you, you might've already done part one, which was the medical impact. Here we are in the emotional impact. Okay, so before, to just lay some groundwork, um, let's do a little science to get us started. Do you know what hormones do in your body, right? All of the different pieces of our body play a role in how it functions. And hormones are your body's chemical messengers. So I think we talk about hormones a lot. And then we're sometimes like, I don't quite know how to differentiate hormones from like, you know, what, what that does different than a platelet or a blood cell, or, you know, we know that our lungs deliver oxygen. What are the hormones doing? So hormones are chemical messengers and hormones affect many body functions, right? So a lot of times we just think about reproductive hormones, but there are many more insulin is a hormone and it regulates blood sugar, right? So th um, there are growth hormones that regulate our growth. There are many, many hormones in our body and they play, and when they're in balance, when they're even and when they're in balance, our body thrives. I like to think of hormones kind of like the pendulum of a clock, right? And when that's swinging nice, you feel good. Your body's working and it's thriving. Um, Hormones play a role in hunger, sleep, controlling blood sugar, fertility, growth, body temperature, stress response, immune system, many things, mood. I didn't put that in here because the rest of my entire presentation is about that, but many different things. So that's an important thing for you to know that there are hormones coursing through your body and they're doing all sorts of things to keep us balanced. Um, when our hormones are in balance, so when that pendulum of the clock is not flowing evenly, your body doesn't feel good, right? So the symptoms of that can be tired, lower frustration tolerance, impatience, food cravings, all right? So when you think about not getting, your body's not getting all of the, all of your, you know, the fuel is in your tank, then you feel a difference in that. You feel slower, you feel heavier. That's the that imbalance of those hormones. Hormone levels change throughout our lifetime. All, they're changing all, they're changing all the time. They're changing daily. They're changing regularly. That's part of that natural rhythm. It's not a static thing, but there are a couple points in particularly a woman's lifetime where there are noticeable changes. Puberty, right? Reproductive years. So your menstrual cycle. And if any of you have ever felt PMS or like, oh, I know my period's coming because I'm impatient and I'm irritable, right? Or I feel tired or I might sleep or I'm not sleeping as well. Those are changes in your hormones. Pregnancy, postpartum, right? Postpartum depression is a hormone issue. So pregnancy is a natural moment of, an, of hormone change. Childbirth, perimenopause and menopause. So these are normal times when we deal, feel a noticeable change in hormones. 
Men have these two, just so you know, but we're just mostly talking about all of you today, women. Other hormones that play a role in our mental health. So we often think about, okay, what are the hormones in our mental health? Serotonin gets a lot of um, attention. Um, estrogen and progesterone, we're talking about those things as it relates to menopause. But other hormones that are important pieces of your mental well being are dopamine, adrenaline. Cortisol is a stress hormone. That's what makes us go into fight flight. Adrenaline, melatonin is the, is the hormone that regulates our sleep cycle. So all of those hormones and their balance also impact how you feel. Menopause. So I like to think, I think this is maybe a, a worth a valuable analogy. Menopause is like your body is uploading a new operating system, right? We have taken out some of the things that, that secrete and, and have hormones and there's a whole new operating system and understandably it feels a bit glitchy. So women who are going through this change in their hormone levels notice the impact of that in many different ways until your body begins to kind of be functioning and regulated again. And that will happen, right? But it takes some time to that for that uploading and the new operating system to take place. The ways in which women feel that. So how does that show up? What are those ways that women notice those changes? So you talked about in part one of this, those physical feelings, hot flashes or night sweats, chills, vaginal dryness, sleep problems, weight gain, slower metabolism. Those are ways that you kind of feel it in your physical body. Emotionally, and see if this resonates too, um, women feel mood swings. Serotonin is a, is a mood regulating hormone. And so when that's not in balance, you can feel that shift in your mood in a different way. Anger and irritability. So anger and irritability are kind of like emotional regulation. And if you're, if you're, first of all, if you're not sleeping as well, well, or if you're uncomfortable in other places, it's quicker, you're quicker to feel that intolerance or that irritability. Forgetfulness poor concentration and focus. So it's harder to attend to something. It's harder to stay focused. That might be related to fatigue. It might also be related to the, the, the haze of attention that can be part of serotonin too. Um, sadness and depression, there's a difference between the two of those things. We're going to talk about that a bit down the road. Um, anxiety, so like a feeling anxiety to me is different than depression and that anxiety has a buzz to it. Anxiety often includes those ruminating, spinning, intrusive thoughts. So how, how that kind of begins to happen and that can be also related to attention, focus, all of those different things. And then a loss of self-esteem and confidence. I think a natural piece of menopause too is that um, it can alter and shift your sense of identity. Right. So it makes you begin to feel like, who am I now? What's going on? Where am, where am I? What is the parts of my femininity that I wasn't prepared for that really feel like a loss to me? And sometimes that begins to have us questioning our confidence and our self-esteem. All of this slide can happen to all women, right? Going through perimenopause and menopause. But there are some distinct differences when we look at the impact of surgical and chemical menopause. And those are grief, right? So when you think about naturally perimenopause and menopause, that generally, and, and down on my page too, I have unexpected slash abrupt or unprepared. And when we think about natural perimenopause or menopause, it happens over a course of a time. It's not like a light switch, right? And so women kind of are kind of in and out of those experiences of that. And they have moments when it feels more intense and moments when it, that feels less intense. If you've had a surgical or chemical menopause, it feels much more abrupt and it feels a lot, a lot to take in at once. And then there's also that feeling of isolated. Perhaps you're younger or you're at a different age point when unlike somebody who's naturally going through menopause and therefore all of their friend group is also going through that and they joke and they laugh and they talk about it together, you could feel very out of sync 
with other people who aren't experiencing this. And even if you are at the same age point, to feel like that was taken from you, that was shifted for you from you without a lot of control can be a grief and a loss. That in grief, well, I say the words grief and loss because they include feelings of anger, sadness, shock. You know, so the, the, that comes into play too. I'm gonna just take a quick moment, stop my share, come back to all of you, see some of those faces that are still there and check in on that chat. I'm seeing some notes there that this is, that totally feel this, that it resonates. And I didn't know if anybody wanted to add anything and to, to share anything before we keep moving on. Just make a little space and time for that. And it's okay if you don't. That's okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to kind of just remind you that you're open to kind of add in and, and keep using that chat. And um, I see that, you know, we're there, that, that idea of grief is huge for you. And, and then somebody also said, I feel like a different person. And, and when you write, I feel like a different person there to me, that's really touching base on that identity shift right? That, that sometimes unbeknownst or in a way of feeling really unprepared, you're, you suddenly feel just different, altogether different. And maybe that's the way in which stress shows up for you, the way in which you're able to care for yourself. All of that is a different lift today than it used to be. And that takes a lot of adjustment. Again, uploading a new operating system. Okay. I'm loving that this chat is blowing up over here a little bit because those that are recording can't hear or see that. I'm just going to read a little bit. Promise I'll keep your names quiet. Um, there's a feeling of unprepared. So somebody's also talking about just after their hysterectomy, so surgical menopause, right? That they just felt unprepared. And I think our medical team, unfortunately, does a lot of work around educating what those medical symptoms might be, physical symptoms but then you're left with the heaviness and the weight of how that affects you and your mood and your, your impatience and your, and your feelings of kind of who you are. And that can feel really disconcerting and maybe even scary, less of a woman. Mm, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wish, I wish the way my vagina used to work. Yeah. Right. We get used to this, this is an important part of our body. And we, 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 that's a part of, you know, the way in which we connect in relationships when we're at, you know, intercourse with our, our partners are just your own sense of kind of self. And then it, everything's changing and all of that, that part of those relationships also then changes. Um, Oh, and another thing adding here too about the kind of the misinformation, the lack of information you might get that you're, there is so much information about cancer and about recurrence and about what those options are. And obviously the surgery is a piece of that treatment that we're kind of missing talking about this really important factor that's going to impact your quality of life. So thank you all for adding there. Keep going. I like to keep the chat open alongside the window so you can kind of watch both at the same time, my words and each other's words. I'm going to go back to my screen. I think the other thing that I want to talk about too is the stigma around the emotional impact of menopause, right? That, that there can be kind of a nonchalance or a flippancy about, oh yeah, you know, that's just what women go through are, you know, you're just feeling irritable because, you know, you're hormonal. And I think that that minimizes and in some ways dismisses the legitimacy of, hey, this is a diagnosis. When my hormones are out of balance, that that is something that is truly significant and affecting how I am able to kind of navigate and manage my day to day. So it isn't that I'm coping poorly or that I suddenly have less tolerance. It's that there are some changes within my system that are making that harder for me. So I think there can still be some stigma around that about you're not coping well, or you're not doing well, or there's some fault and shame and blame in that. And our society is getting a lot better about talking about postpartum depression, right? And talking about miscarriage as it relates to women's health. But I think that menopause still kind of lives in those stigmatized shadows a bit. And, um, and we need to do a bit more to talk about that. I see a hand over there. I'm not going to call out on your name, but if you want to say anything, feel free to unmute and add in. Or maybe that hand is just like, I hear you, lady, me too, which is also totally cool. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yes. Awesome. I feel like um like menopause alone is, you know, everyone's expected to go through it. So when I got the surgical menopause, I felt like no one understood me. They didn't really understand the abrupt change. They just thought, oh, well, this is normal. And so I felt like I didn't get any understanding from medical friends, anybody, because it's like, oh, this is normal. But it didn't feel normal because it was so abrupt earlier than it was supposed to be. And so I find that comparing notes with other women that are going through menopause, I just feel sort of like, I feel sort of anger and like I I got gypped, you know? (laughs) I missed out on those 10, 15 years where I could have not been menopausal. So it just, it is good to read this thing that you, this chart you posted. Very good to see that. I'm not the only one that felt all these things. Oh, yes. And I think what I'm hearing you say is grief, right? You're talking to me or what I, the, the words that really hit me when you just mentioned that, where I didn't get those 10 to 15 years where I was still going to be premenopausal. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, this is going to happen to me as a woman, but not yet. I wasn't yeah. there yet. And I'm grieving the fact that I am still here and still, you know, walking through my day to day, but I'm dealing with this earlier than I had planned or wanted to, obviously. Thank you. The other thing is when we talk about unprepared and people say, oh, this is normal. Well, let's just make a metaphor, right? It's I'm, I'm looking out. We have a snow day down. I don't know if you guys see out my windows it is like a blizzard where I am. It's just, my kids are all home from school. It's a snow day. Um, it is normal to have a snow day and a blizzard in the month of February, but just because it's normal doesn't mean you can't, you don't prepare for that. Because if I walk out into the snow with my short sleeves on and my flip flops, that's going to be a terrible experience, right? So just because menopause is normal, doesn't mean that we don't have to do some work and put some things scaffolding around so that you can cope with that discomfort or what's not, not easy to deal with. Like if it's going to be a snow day, I'm going to want some boots. I'm going to want a hat, mittens, and a good coat, right? So if menopause is normal, what do we need in order to walk through this time so that you're prepared and that you've got the support that's important to you? Does that make sense? Does that metaphor make sense? Sometimes I make crazy metaphors. I hope they make sense to you. Um, another one, just for, for the, just a relationship, I think of the relationship body image and your body is it's a relationship, right? And when someone ha- go, is diagnosed with cancer, that relationship with your body is affected and you feel that. And then even with the diagnosis, and then we put something like surgical menopause and we completely change many of the ways in which your body are. And that effect that can be, that can bring up a lot of feelings, you know, around, I don't understand this. So when somebody wrote in the chat, I feel like a whole new person, your relationship with this vessel, the body that you live in has completely changed and you're having to get to know it. And there can be things that show up in my office quite commonly and are very normal, normal doesn't mean it's easy, but normal to experience are a real difficulty connecting to your body. And I also think about as you go through a treatment for a gynecologic cancer, there's a lot of intrusiveness to that diagnosis and to the treatment and testing related to those gynecological cancers. And it is normal and protective that a lot of women kind of dissociate. You get to put your head in the corner of the room in order to, in order to tolerate some of this intimacy and invasion to your body in private places. And then when we come back into life, how do you reconnect and really kind of refamiliarize yourself and get reconnected to your body? People avoid their body. They're scared to slow down and pay attention to what they're feeling or what's going on in this new system or this new um, vessel that they're in. There's a very strong feeling. And many people in my office talk about it, a feeling like their bodies let them down or that they can't trust their body anymore. So I don't know, I'm having new feelings, new sensations. I don't know if it's a problem or if it's new. I don't know how to trust my body. Um, And that is, makes it hard to listen. It makes it hard to pay slow. Like I said, slow down and listen. You can feel real anger and injustice. 
Um, and, and that's normal. It, again, normal doesn't mean easy, but sometimes it helps. I watch in my office when we talk about these things and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said out loud, seeing these slides is helpful. And I think the reason why it's helpful is because until you understand that this is a normative re response and reaction, you can kind of feel crazy. Like I'm doing this thing. And if I'm being really honest with myself, I'm really just kind of totally dissociated from my body. Or I'm very, very angry about my, I'm putting on smoke screens and I'm moving about my life, but deep down, I'm so pissed. I'm so angry. And, and under that anger is deep, deep, vulnerable sadness, right? So when I put this out here and tell you, hey, I'd be surprised if you didn't feel that way, that can be helpful. It doesn't make that feeling easier, but it's helpful to know, oh, I'm not the only one. There can be a longing for your old body. I guess I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I want to go back. So right now we are, oh, oh no, we've got a couple more slides, but I know it's also time for our um, first breakout session. I'm going to say this one slide and then we're going to move into our breakout and then I'll pop backwards. But um, menopause and stage of life plus cancer. So when women go through menopause naturally, they tend to be at a stage in their life that is also quite busy and filled with a lot of other outside stressors too. Some women are parenting, right? And there's the, the stressors of that, wherever that might fall in your bandwidth. Some women might be dealing with aging parents, right? Some women are still working and building at a point in their life when they're really chugging away and building their career, a lot of women through midlife are also kind of going through, not to minimize this midlife crisis of like, who am I? You know, where am I in my life? What, what am I doing? Where am I on track? Am I who I'm wanting to be? Okay, so those are those bottom bullet points. Now let's go to the top of this slide. And those top bullet points are, let's add cancer on this, right? So you can feel really out of sync with your peers. I'm going through menopause. No one else my age is going through menopause. That's really lonely. Um, I feel really, and therefore feel really isolated and lacking support in this particular thing and cancer in general, a loss of fertility. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about how a um, surgical menopause includes loss of fertility, or if not a loss of fertility, which it probably does a significant change in the way that you're thinking about family building. Um, and that also changes body image. I was born with these parts. They are distinct. They're what part of what make me female. And now they're not, they're not useful in the same way. And so then how does that, how do I feel in my relationships as a woman? Um, and brain fog, menopause can cause that brain fog right at a time in your life when you are doing a lot of things that require quite a bit of attention and concentration. So I put all this out here. The first, we're going to break into our first breakout room. And in this time together, what I hope for, for all of you, what I'm going to send you off with a wish is, is this resonating? Do you feel this? What are the ways you have been most affected by menopause based on these slides where I've kind of already kind of taken us? And do you also feel the stigma associated with the emotional side of menopause, right? Like, oh, it's normal, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which are all a little bit minimizing and dismissive. So I want, that's kind of where I want you to just join each other, find each other, share openly, and then we'll come back and we're going to see, well, what do we do about it? Okay. Welcome back, everybody. That always feels abrupt, right? It's like right when everybody's really talking and then it goes. So if that's how you might have felt just a second ago, we're going to have another breakout room. And so we can kind of keep the conversation going. But before I jump back into my slides, um, I appreciate all of your honesty and, and spaces. I, I joined Nefertari's um, room. She was probably like, great, Julie's in my room. <laughs> but I, I kept my, my camera off and my voice and I really appreciate all the talking that happened there. Do the three um, kind of facilitators of those spaces just kind of want to give us just a little peek into the main theme that happened in each of your rooms? I can 
start yeah. off and be like, I wrote it down, going back to that forget, forgetfulness. <laughs> so some of the things I wrote, well, the main thing I would say, you know, not being told uh, about um, the changes that you'll go through uh, and in particular sexual, your sexuality and the loss of, uh, you know, those body parts or your old body. Um, mm-hmm. And also another thing that came up was caring for small children while going through uh, menopause. So those were like the two main topics. Thanks. Um, for us, the essentially the two main topics were just kind of being unprepared and kind of going into to having a hysterectomy or you know a surgical removal of your ovaries and cervix and just not being a clear line of communication between the doctor and the patient of kind of what hormonal changes are going to happen and, mm-hmm. and how your body's going to be affected post-surgery. Um, and also um, just discussing the sexual intimacy aspect of it, you know, feeling comfortable talking to your doctor and just kind of being, um, someone mentioned that they discussed it with their doctor and they kind of just gave them a cream to, to help make sexual intimacy easier, but didn't really discuss kind of why they're feeling this way and kind of, you know, just not a one-stop kind of shop kind of situation and, you know, wanted some more communication with the, the doctor in regards to uh, the sexual intimacy aspect. Mm-hmm. It sounds like kind of some similar themes in both. What about, um, what about you, Miranda? Uh, I would say one of the first things we kind of discussed is just the similarity um, among women of all ages, just having this instantaneous menopause that you can be on either end of the age spectrum and still have similar experiences. But also I think um, another thing we discussed was dealing with different issues along with menopause. So whether you are still in cancer treatment or you have any other kind of Um, comorbidities that just add to that stacking of that um, heightened emotional, you know, physical aspect of menopause that it can be difficult. Thanks. I think another thing that came up in ours too, when we talked about stigma, like what does that mean? And I think it, uh, there was a, there was a comment about the lifetime of the stigma that, you know, as young girls, oh, you're on the rag. That's why you're so teary and emotional. Um, are, you know, she's being crazy because her period's coming and how, and are irrational and how those ways that we talk about our hormones are really derogatory and, um, and condescending, right. And, and it leaves you feeling like there's some personal responsibility for this or that there's nothing you can do. It's totally out of your hands. And so if anything, I also want this, um, this presentation, which is why I started it with hormones to say to you, Hey, there is something that's going on in your body that is leading you to feel different. It is not that you suddenly have lost your coping skills, your perspective and your motivation and interest, right? There is also something that is impacting your ability to get moving and to care for yourself in normative way, in ways that you're used to, not normative, in familiar ways, right? So I think that that's important to talk about. Um, I'm going to jump back to our slides, but I, I appreciate those main themes that came up. Um, and I hope that if you are someone that have, that has found a way to navigate having conversations around sexuality with your medical team, that you speak up in these next breakout and share what's worked for you and how you did that. Cause I want to use each other in that process of how we kind of begin to assert ourselves and have these very important conversations. Let's go back to my slides here. And I know I've got to bounce back a bit, but. Let's see. So we talked about this and and that also came up in our group too, about how, you know, women are navigating this emotional, you know, these emotional symptoms and this loss at a time in their life when there are many other stressors happening. And the fact that cancer can often interrupt that life stage too, in ways that bring on grief and, and a feeling of isolation. So that did come up in ours. Um, Okay. So then it's interesting that I put this slide here because maybe it belonged after this breakout anyway. (laughs) But one of the first coping tools, and I'm going to go ahead and call this a tool, a strategy. 
Um, and I do it in my office a lot. If you have joined the ovarian cancer, um, let's talk about a program and you know me, you know, I talk about this a lot is um, self-compassion is key. What does that mean? This is a self-compassion tool and I call it the reality check. Let's put all this on the table, all of it. The, the hormones that you don't have control over, the, um, the, fat, the stages of your life, your diagnosis of cancer, all of these different factors. And there are many multifactorial, there are many things that are contributing to the suffering or the discomfort or the unsettledness that you're feeling. And some, many of those are also outside of your control. You did not design this moment. And I think that when we do this exercise of the reality check, that it helps to remove some of the shame and the blame that comes into play when we think about negative self-talk and self-esteem and our sense of worth, that you're not, there's, it makes sense that you might be struggling. And sometimes just putting that reality check out there helps us to begin to lower expectations and to begin to piece this together in really honest and thoughtful ways about how we're going to move forward. I was in session this morning and after about 15 minutes of listening to this woman tell me about everything that she's going on, I said, hold on. What you're telling me is that your father just got admitted to the hospital, that your twins are having behavioral issues in their preschool, that you are dealing with treatment, that your husband is traveling right now for work, and that nobody but you is grocery shopping. No wonder you feel overwhelmed. Okay. So hold on. So that's the reality check. Can you do that for yourself? And can you look at yourself in the mirror and be like, well, of course I feel tired. Of course I feel sad, right? This is what, this is a big change. Life doesn't have to be put on hold when you're caring for yourself during menopause, right? You want to keep engaged. You want to, you want to keep going. You won't want to like check out and withdraw. Depression and sadness and vulnerability have an urge. Those feel, those experiences, the urge is to pull back. The urge is to tuck in. And why is that? Because everything else is overwhelming and uncertain and a bit scary. And so we're going to tighten it up and, and make it feel a little more safe. But sometimes in that withdrawal, we run the risk of, of further isolating ourselves. And that can lead to more anxiety and more depression. So, so as we continue to kind of live our lives in the midst of this, understanding the science and doing that self-compassion reality check kind of helps to level the playing field. I've got something. And it also says to us, okay, this is real and I can't um, ignore it, or toxic positivity myself, which means I'm just going to pull myself up by the bootstraps and put on a shiny face and keep moving out in the world and white knuckle it. No, there is something that I'm dealing with. And now I have to take responsibility in caring for myself and getting my hat and my winter boots. What do I need in order to deal with this reality? One of the first things I also say to people, and besides the reality check, is notice yourself. So if you have a piece of paper and a pen and you are trying to figure out how do I move forward in this, make a note. Can you cultivate a habit of just checking in with yourself, noticing how you're feeling and trying to find the words to describe it? You know what? I woke up this morning and I'm feeling some dread. I'm feeling low energy. I'm feeling irritated. I'm feeling impatient. I'm feeling really proud. I'm feeling joyful. I'm feeling excited. Can you begin to put some words to how you're feeling? Sometimes we're just flying through our life really fast and we're not tuning in. And just that act of tuning in is the starting block to then what you're going to do to care for yourself in a very specific way related to that feeling, right? If we don't know how we're feeling, then how do we care for ourselves? So step one, monitor your mood. Notice how you're feeling. And that's not only going to help you begin to plug in some specific and helpful coping skills, but it also might begin to help you, number three, watch for patterns in your moods or watch for the ways things change. 
And a lot of times when I'm sitting with somebody who's experiencing quite a bit of heaviness and distress, we don't jump right to, you know, an extreme kind of intervention, but you know what, let's note this day, let's circle it on the calendar and, and see how, if this feeling changes. And sometimes that um, awareness of impermanence can be your best friend, right? That this day is feeling really heavy. This day I was feeling bleak. I'm feeling uncertain. I'm feeling a lot of grief. So I'm noticing how I'm feeling. I'm going to check in with myself. I'm going to lower my expectations. I'm going to figure out the way, the comfort and the things I'm needing in this day. And then I'm also going to make a note of it because come maybe come Saturday, I feel totally different. Or even when I wake up tomorrow morning, I feel different. And for you to be able to notice those waves of your feeling might also be helpful when you're tolerating a dip. Okay, I'm here. And I know because I've been here before, it changes, it shifts. It's not comfortable right now, but I know that it will not feel this way forever. So watch for those, those, those um, waves and those patterns in your mood or the other symptoms that you feel. Maybe it's even just fogginess and a hard time concentrating and paying attention. Make space for self-care. You know, I was reading, I do some research, obviously, before I dive into these topics. And one of the things that I actually kind of loved, although it sounds a little disciplined, is that sometimes this menopause menopause, and the changes that a woman's body feels is the kick in the pants to say, you matter. And you have every right to take some space and some time to take care of yourself. What do you need? How do you do that? And, and how do you figure out who to communicate that with so that all the other complexities of your life get done too? And then number five in this list is back to basics. Sometimes we want to plug in all these fancy ways of caring for ourselves, but there is a miraculous benefit to sleep, staying, staying kind of fed through the day, you know, not getting so that you're super hungry and then you're foggy and kind of like low energy. Exercising does help. Breathing, those things do help. Getting to know, I'm watching my time and knowing that we have this other um, this other breakout that we want to do. So I'm going to kind of flip around a little bit. Getting to know your changed physical self, it takes time. Connecting to other people, reminding yourself that a feeling is simply a feeling. There's no right or wrong way or good or bad way to feel. Giving yourself kind of some permission to have all of those feelings. And then not just noticing the moments that are not working, but give yourself credit. That's homework that I often give my clients. Hey, give yourself credit for what you're doing that's totally working. Are the moments when you do feel a sense of contentment and calm and pride. Can we also notice those for the purpose of balancing? Managing the mind, when you pay attention, when we cultivate that, that process of kind of noticing how you're feeling, that might then lead to the next step of what am I doing in this moment that's working for me? And what am I doing in this moment that's not working for me? And that's where I really kind of want you to talk in this next breakout session is what you notice works and what you notice kind of compounds the feeling or continues to get into your way. Let's do our next breakout because I want to make space for that. And then we'll bounce back to these slides. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I, I bounced around. Uh, thank you to the host that kept just moving me. Um, and I was listening to a lot of different conversations. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to redirect you and to encourage you to put some in the chat because what you're saying to each other matters so much and it's good stuff. So keep putting it there. I'm looking at my time. We are closing in on the end of this hour and I've got some meaty stuff for you. So I'm giving you a heads up. We're going to fly. <laughs> are you ready? We're going to move fast and I'm going to cover a lot of stuff. So get ready, buckle up. I'm, I've lived a long time in New York City. I can talk fast. Um, but we're going to talk about some important things. Some of the things I listened to, I'm going um, to, if it's okay with those facilitators, I might just kind of pop and say some of the things that I heard for purpose of time. Um, knowing what brings you happiness. You've lived here for a long time, folks. 
some things at work within you. What, what brings you happiness? What matters to you? Can you orchestrate and facilitate and plug that in and go there, do those things? Somebody in one of the groups um, has a moment of mindfulness. And I love that. Just five or 10 minutes that they plug in and they put in their day. The reason why I like that is that we get treatment prescribed by our medical team and we take it like clockwork, right? That should also be like clockwork. How do we plug in emotional self-care that is your treatment plan? And it is non-negotiable. You have to do this because your mental health is dependent upon it. And in fact, in my opinion, granted I'm biased, you're, if you're struggling with depression or the emotional impact of menopause, it may have more negative consequences over time than osteoporosis. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to do a treatment plan for your mental health. All right. Um, somebody talked to, how do I get out of sadness? Somebody said those words, how do I get out of sadness? And I just want to see if it would be okay if I tweak that word and I think about not getting out of it, but getting through it. All of your emotions have a space and a time and how do you move through them? And sometimes looking it right in the eye and saying, why am I sad? What am I grieving? What is that unmet met need below me? If we keep getting away from the discomfort, we're missing the valuable information that the sadness or the anger or the injustice is telling us right? Anger might make us stand up and assert ourselves because something that matters a great deal to us is threatened. So how do we have those conversations with our medical team? Sadness is grief. What am I needing? What do I just need to mourn and feel, right? So how do we go through those feelings? Um, a lot of people talked about connecting, finding other people, paying attention. I am going to pop over here to my slides you may not get through all of these, um, these things, but there are certain ones that matter to me. This is natural ways to boost those feel good hormones. So remember my telling you that your mental health is dependent upon a number of different hormones. There are some ways that you can naturally get a boost of those hormones. When you get outside, there is research evidence-based that nature, the big blue sky, breathing in big air, all of that walking barefoot through grass, all of those things truly do help to regulate stress hormones. So stress hormones are cortisol, um, adrenaline. Those things will help and get more regulated. You can find your way through that stress cycle by just getting outside. You'll feel a difference. Sometimes I talk about it as popping the bubble of stress. Exercise, laugh, sobbing, or hanging out in a prolonged hug. Not like a hug, like, mm, love you. But like, just get that person in your arms and stay there, body to body, tight. Hold on, let your heartbeat start to come down together in that hug, exercise up. All those things are pieces of the puzzle of those hormonal regulation that complete the stress cycle. So when we're stressed, we have that stress cycle, fight, flight, freeze. We stay there. How do we get back balanced and calm? Some of these things can help us to get there. Think about a little tiny kiddo. When they fall and they scrape their knees, what do we do? We scoop them up and we put them in our arms and we hold them until they're calm. Do that for yourself. That is actually helping. Complete a project. If you're somebody that does a project, a craft, your new home improvement, I don't know what you do. Make a dinner, do something. If you complete a project and you feel proud about it, you get a dopamine boost, a natural dopamine boost. Dopamine is the hormone in our brains that is our reward center. It plays a part in addiction, you know, all of those things, but it's because it gives you a reward for completing something. So you can boost that reward feeling of pride and feel good and accomplishments and competency by doing a project and finishing it. Um, snuggle. <laughs> snuggle releases oxytocin. Oxytocin is known as the feel good hormone, the, the, um, the, the love snuggle hormone. And when you snuggle somebody, when you have that moment standing and watching a sunset and feeling like all those gooey, gooey feelings, that's oxytocin coursing through your veins. And you can get that in those ways. Sleep is melatonin. Drinking water is hydration, which keeps all those hormones in good fluid movement. And eating through the day is not just about having healthy eating habits, but it maintains that insulin level and your blood sugar and all that does also affect how you're feeling. Quick thing about mood and depression. Depression is persistent. That goes back to notice it. 
log it on your log it on your calendar. It make it, it is also a hormone imbalance. Clinical depression is a medical diagnosis, and antidepressants can help with that. There are other some strategies that can help to begin to kind of structure yourself around those feelings. Seek professional help. Counseling, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy is about how you're thinking and how that affects your mood. All of those things can also help you to feel different too. I know we are at the end of our hour. I wish we had so much more time. I could dig deeper and dive. Keep finding each other. Keep having these important conversations with each other. I could have just, I wrote all kinds of notes about sexuality and I, we could have talked more, much more about that. Um, keep seeking each other out and being honest and open. I think that that's a pathway to feeling better too. Thank you, Julie. And thank you to everyone who participated today. Um, this was a new format for us. We haven't done a program like this before, um, but I hope you like it, liked it. Um, make sure to check out our upcoming educational programs and support groups and follow us on social media. Um, that's the way to stay up to date on everything we have going on. And as I mentioned, we've never done a program like this before, so we would really love to hear your feedback. So please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end. The survey will pop up um, in the browser once we end the meeting. Um, and yeah, we want to know if you'd like to see more programs like this. So thank you again, Julie, and thank you so much to everyone participating today um, and sharing with each other. Mm. Thank you all. Embrace the day ahead. <laughs>